In this first presentation for Unit 4, we're going to be looking at four topics, 4.1 through 4.4. Cell communication, introduction to signal transduction, signal transduction, and changes in signal transduction pathways. In any single-celled organism, all of the functions of life are carried out by that single cell. However, for multicellular organisms, where different regions of the organism's body or different cell or tissue types carry out specific focused tasks, coordination of those functions is necessary to sustain life. Some cell and tissue types are charged with responding to stimuli, others defend against pathogens, and yet others are responsible for obtaining and processing nutrients. In order for coordination to be established, cells throughout an organism's body utilize mechanisms that involve chemical communication to ensure proper functioning. By logical extension, that means that failure in communication systems may result in a variety of disorders or diseases. Although the chemical communication systems utilized by a multicellular organism function in the same general way, one manner in which they can be differentiated is based on the distance across which the chemical signal travels. The first classification of communication is called autocrine signaling, which is defined by a cell producing a chemical messenger that triggers a response within itself. For example, in response to an infection, some immune system cells will produce chemical messengers to initiate defense mechanisms within themselves. The second type of communication involves a physical connection between two cells. In this way, a signaling cell can produce a chemical messenger that will travel through a protein that connects it to a recipient target cell. In animal cells, these connector proteins are called gap junctions, and in plant cells, they're called plasmodesmata. Paracrine signaling is the third type of cell-to-cell -cell communication. In this category, signaling cells will release chemical messengers that target local nearby cells that are 20 to 25 cell diameters away. Upon receipt of the chemical messenger, the target cell's response will begin. One such example of paracrine signaling is a category of proteins called hedgehog proteins. Having nothing to do specifically with actual hedgehogs, these proteins are actually produced in all animals and are important in signaling mechanisms during embryonic development for the regulation of proper cell differentiation. Growth factors are signaling molecules that are important in the regulation of cell growth and division, as well as wound healing. Finally, endocrine signaling makes possible long-distance chemical communication throughout an organism's entire body. This system makes use of circulating fluids like blood to transport chemical messengers like hormones. Because of the variety of hormones produced by an organism, and that they can vary from species to species, studying all of them is far beyond the scope of the curriculum, and we will therefore limit our study to only a few examples. After all, in humans and other mammals alone, there are over 50 different kinds of hormone signals. Each of those four distant scales of cell communication involves the use of chemical messengers, generically referred to as ligands, that are produced by a secretory cell and received by a target cell. In order for a cell to be considered a target cell for a given ligand, it must possess the appropriate receptor protein embedded in its cell membrane. This allows for a ligand that may be circulating throughout an organism's entire body to be responded by specific cells only. Once a ligand has bound to a target cell's receptor protein, the receptor's conformation changes and sets into motion a series of changes within the cell. 
Signal transduction has three steps, reception of the ligand, transduction of the signal, and the cellular response. In the reception stage, a ligand binds to a target cell's receptor protein. While there are a number of different kinds of receptor proteins, G-protein coupled receptors are one of the most common ones. Let's take a look at a short animation that will describe the basic function of one of these receptors. An external signal, such as a hormone, binds to a receptor protein on the plasma membrane. The receptor molecule undergoes a change that causes a G protein to bind to it inside the cell. The activated receptor stimulates the G protein to release its GDP and bind to GTP, guanosine triphosphate, Bound to GTP, the G protein becomes activated. The two parts of the G protein move away from the receptor and from each other to interact with target proteins. A target protein or effector may be an ion channel that opens or closes in response to the G protein, or it may be an enzyme that the G protein activates or inactivates. In any case, the effector produces a result inside the cell without the external signal ever having crossed the plasma membrane. One important point to note that the animation included, which is actually the basis behind signal transduction, is that the intracellular response is initiated by an extracellular ligand. When a G protein is activated, each portion triggers a different part of the cellular response. The alpha subunit activates a protein that utilizes ATP to form cyclic AMP. The beta and gamma subunits are associated with ion channels and kinase proteins. We'll see more about those components to signal transduction in the next step. Target cells for a given ligand can be distributed throughout an organism's body and have very different functions. For example, the hormone epinephrine more commonly known as adrenaline, has target cells present in the heart, liver, lungs, and even the muscle that regulates the size of our eye's pupils. The transduction stage takes place within the cell and involves numerous protein and non-protein components. An important family of at least 500 different kinds of proteins are called kinases. They are activated by the beta-gamma subunits of G proteins and relay a signal from protein to protein by utilizing ATP to phosphorylate subsequent proteins to activate them. As this model demonstrates, in a phosphorylation cascade, a kinase protein becomes activated when it is phosphorylated, which in turn leads it to phosphorylate the next kinase in the chain and so on, ultimately resulting in a cellular response. Another component of the transduction stage involves cyclic AMP, which isn't a protein at all. Related to ATP, cyclic AMP is a second messenger whose production is by the alpha subunit of the G protein. Adenylyl cyclase removes two phosphates from ATP to form cyclic AMP, which goes on to activate protein kinase A. As long as the G protein is associated with adenylyl cyclase, cyclic AMP will be produced. This is an important mechanism by which cells can amplify their response to a chemical signal. A single ligand molecule can result in the production of numerous cyclic AMP molecules and lead to the activation of numerous kinases. The final stage of signal transduction is the cellular response. Responses are varied and numerous and depend on what the ligand is, the concentration of the ligand, and the type of target cell that's receiving the signal. For that reason, we will look at examples of types of responses rather than specific responses. Some typical responses include cells activating or repressing genes within the nucleus. 
this would result in a cell producing more or less of the protein that a gene is responsible for. Another important response involves the stimulation or repression of the cell cycle. Regulation of this mechanism is important in ensuring that cells divide and reproduce only when necessary. A cell or tissue type may experience a change in metabolic rate, an increase or decrease, thanks to signal transduction. This could result in the anabolism or catabolism of carbohydrates, for example, to store or release energy, respectively. Signal transduction is also linked to the death of cells. A normal process that occurs during both embryonic development and throughout an organism's life, as well as during an immune response, apoptosis is when a cell commits suicide in response to a signal molecule telling it to do so. Let's look at a few more specific examples of signal transduction. Cytokines are a family of dozens of ligands that activate a wide variety of genes responsible for things such as cell replication, defense from pathogens, and cells that have become cancerous. During the embryonic development of male mammals, a single gene found on the Y chromosome is responsible for activating genes that lead to the development of male anatomy, as well as the deactivation of genes associated with female anatomy. In animals as varied as fruit flies, sea urchins, and humans, Hox genes are important in the development of anatomical structures, like limbs, as well as the orientation of the organism's entire body. Liver cells are storage sites for complex carbohydrates called glycogen, a polymer of glucose molecules. Liver cells respond to epinephrine by breaking down glycogen to release more glucose into the bloodstream, ultimately to be utilized by muscle cells for the production of ATP. Signal transduction is not limited to animals, however. Plants produce a gaseous hormone called ethylene, which initiates the ripening process by activating genes that produce enzymes to soften and sweeten the fruit. Even fungi have signal transduction pathways. Although yeast cells can reproduce asexually, if two yeast types are present, A and alpha, they release pheromone molecules to which each other are sensitive. This leads to a fusion and eventual reproduction of those cells in a process cutely named yeast mating. In order for signal transduction pathways to function as intended, both the ligand and the receptor protein must be conformed properly. If a cell possesses a mutation that prevents it from constructing a receptor protein with the proper shape, that would result in a cell incapable of detecting the presence of a given ligand. Additionally, were a cell to have a mutation that disallowed it from manufacturing ligands properly, then no target cell would be able to receive that signal. And finally, to close out our look at signal transduction, pharmaceutical drugs. Many pharmaceuticals' mechanism of action involves blocking receptor proteins. Aspirin, for example, blocks the production of a few types of signaling molecules, which has the effect of blocking the transmission of pain signals to the brain, inhibiting the signal transduction pathways involved with inflammation, and even interferes with the brain's ability to regulate the body's thermostat, effectively helping to reduce fever. And that concludes this video on cell communication and signal transduction. Thank you for watching. Until next time, take care.